family for that reminder of the victory that we have in Jesus. And that every single one of us, if we're in Christ, can claim that victory already this morning. That's just awesome. Thank you all for that. Thank you for Bobby for your, bringing us the meditation. And Randy as well. And Debbie, Eddie, all those who have already participated in the worship service today. We're so thankful. I'm curious this morning, how many have already had a, a cup of coffee this morning? Raise your hand. Some of y'all shot that hand up. How many of you have more than one cup of coffee already this morning? <laughs> a couple of y'all already have. You know, I, uh, I know that a lot of us uh, turn to coffee for that little extra boost of strength in the morning. And uh, I never was a coffee drinker until about the last couple of years. And I thought maybe it's just, you know, getting a little older or having kids that are wanting to be up all hours of the morning and the night. I could use that little extra boost in the morning having that coffee. Well, this morning, especially because uh, my allergies were really getting to me last night, I couldn't hardly breathe. So I took one of those nice nighttime allergy pills. <laughs> and uh, it helped me sleep pretty well, but it was sure difficult getting up this morning. So I'm a little hyped up on some coffee to get that little extra burst of strength. You know, and it's interesting how much we talk about needing a little extra strength. You know, we talk about when pain comes, we need extra strength medicine. You know, when we need extra patience for the day, maybe it's the co-workers or the week ahead of you. But you know, I think that we find our strength best when we're in community together. And so today, we're in week three of the Together series. We talked about together we find peace, together we experience love, and now today, together we grow stronger. But before we get into that too much, I want to ask you, does anybody know what the largest single organism on the planet is? A tree. A tree? A tree? And Kevin, that's pretty good. In fact, it's not just one tree. Well, it kind of is. Show them this picture. This, if you can kind of see what it is, those yellow trees, they're aspen trees. And uh, what this is actually called is, it's called pando. And what it is, is it's the largest grouping of aspen trees on the planet. It's found in Utah. And you say, well, wait a minute, that's just a bunch of trees together. Well, actually, it is one single organism. Because all of these trees, they cover over 100 acres of land, share the same root system. And genetically speaking, they are all identical to one another. So it's really like it's one tree with 100 acres worth of branches. And I share that with you this morning as kind of an illustration of what Jesus said. He said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. You have to stay connected to the vine in order to grow and to be nourished. And that's kind of like us here in the church. We have to be connected, first of all, to Jesus. He is our source of strength and nourishment. But we also have to be connected to one another. Yeah, just like that picture there. It's one group of root systems but all of those hundred acres of trees. And what's interesting is that Pando is actually being threatened right now, and there are people that are trying to protect it and preserve it. You see, Pando has been uh, in existence for thousands upon thousands of years. And as some trees grow older and, and pass on, new trees are being brought up, and the organization, the, or, the organism continues. And that's really a lot like the church. You see, the church that we are a part of today is the same church that Jesus and his apostles established in the first century. But yet it grows. Its location might be different. It's not over, you know, we're not over in the Middle East right now. We're here in America. But we're all interconnected to Christ and one another through the Holy Spirit. And just as Pando is being threatened and people have to preserve it, in order to keep it growing stronger, we as a church have to preserve that unity. We are given a responsibility to build one another <coughs> up in the faith. Because together we do grow stronger. So I think that this is just a great picture of how we as believers can be connected together to build one another up. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you again that you are our source of strength and that you have, you have bonded us together through the Holy Spirit. May we be a church that's united, not just here in these walls, but with the church universal, setting our sight on your purpose and your calling to reach a lost and dying world. May you strengthen us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
we're in this season, we're going back to church season. It's the fall, things are kind of getting back into our regular routine, our regular schedule. People are, are starting to return back to church after a busy summer. And so we say that this season of being together, we're talking about the importance of being together as a church. Because by, by its very nature, the church is a place where we can live and learn and worship and grow and make an impact on the world around us. We've been looking through the book of Ephesians. And if you remember, we talked about the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Ephesians from a, a Roman jail cell. And he wrote it to this church that he helped establish several years earlier to encourage them. First, by reminding them about the gospel. He, he spends the first part of the book just saying how amazing the grace of Jesus Christ is. And don't forget that it is by grace you have been saved. And this isn't of yourself. This is a gift of God. And because of the amazing grace that God gives to us, he then shifts his gears to talk about how we as Christians can live out that grace. What it actually looks like to be a Christian living day to day. And he takes that, that turn in what we're going to look at. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 1. Paul says, As a prisoner of our Lord, then I urge you to live a life that is worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Did you know that you've been called by God? Every single person has been called by God. First, to a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. If you're here today and Jesus is not your Lord and Savior and you are still in your sins, know that the very first calling that God has on your life is to be forgiven, to be saved. And don't leave this place today without making that decision to give your life over to the Lord. But the second calling that God has given to each one of us once we are in Christ is to be united together. We have a responsibility to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. And what does that mean? We, we can never possibly earn God's grace or pay Him back for what He's given us. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying that we are to work together to preserve unity, to be bound together in love, to strengthen one another as we all pursue Jesus Christ together. That's why unity and peace in the church is so important. It's a part of the church that we get built up for the work that God's called us to do. So this morning, we're going to look at four reasons why we need to be united together to one another. And the first one is this. Very simply, there is strength in numbers. We are stronger when there are more of us working together. We talked about this before. Many hands make light work. How much easier is it to accomplish something when you are partnered with other people? Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to skip down to verses 15 and 16. It says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Paul uses this illustration of the body many times throughout Scripture. And just as we talk about the body isn't just made up of one part, but of many, they are to work together. They have a responsibility to do the, the job they've been called to do. And when each body part does what it's supposed to do, the whole body is strengthened. Think of it like this. Think of the mighty rivers in our country. Think of the Mississippi River. Anybody ever see where the Mississippi River actually starts? It just starts with some melted ice and some small trickles of water. And those small trickles, they flow together and they become a stream. And those little streams, they flow together until finally you have the mighty rushing Mississippi. Now, the water itself hasn't changed. It's still the little trickle but it's been united together with more water to become something great. And that's a picture of what the church is like. 
Water comes together to form something greater. We come together to form something greater than ourselves. Think about it like this. Many animals in nature, for protection and for the provision, what do they do? They group together. They, they get in packs. They work together because being out in the wilderness stranded by yourself can be pretty dangerous. And being stranded by yourself in this world, even as a Christian, can be dangerous because you're facing temptation. You're facing struggles. We all get discouraged. We need one another to build one another up. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 says it like this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other one up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now the point of strength in numbers isn't to say, we just need to get more and more people here. Which we do, but the purpose isn't just to fill numbers or to have a big number on that board over there. The purpose is that more and more people can be bound together through unity in Jesus Christ. Be strengthened in the Holy Spirit. That we can support and lift up one another. That's the purpose. Because as we build community and fellowship with one another, we become equipped for the ministry that God's called us to. That's the second reason why we need to be together. Why we find strength together. As we build community and fellowship, everyone here was created to be in relationship with God and other people. Everyone here has been called to a ministry, and your ministry might look completely different than everyone else's. Our diversity as a church in our giftings and our callings is what makes us stronger. Not everybody's going to be up here on stage singing or teaching or performing in some way. Not everybody's going to be teaching a class or working in the nursery or greeting at the door or cooking a meal, but someone is. Someone's been called to each of these tasks. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles and prophets, the evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach all unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We all have different gifts, but it's important that we work together. And it's important that we use them and test them out. You might say, well, I don't, I don't know that I'm ready. I don't know that it's going to be perfect. I don't know. It's okay. It's not perfect. In fact, working out our faith is often really messy. And we make mistakes, but we learn and we grow from those mistakes. We find our calling by getting out and trying. What is God called you to do? What passion has He put on His heart, on your heart? We all have to be united together to pursue the fullness of Christ. And notice I said pursue, because none of us is there yet. None of us has received the fullness of Christ. We are becoming more and more like Christ daily if we are seeking Him. And we need to be doing that together. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. God has given each of us different callings, but one purpose. To be united in faith and mature in the fullness of Christ. One of the great strengths that we have as a church is that when we journey together, when we're all on the same page, and we're all pushing for the same goal, the many become one. Now, who here knows what the official motto of the United States is? The official motto. In God we trust. It's the official motto. But there's also kind of a traditional motto too. 
In fact, it's all on the back of a lot of our currency. If you flip over a coin, you'll see it on there. It's a Latin phrase. Anybody know what that Latin phrase is? E pluribus unum, or unum. Anybody know what it means? One. Out of many, one. And it's kind of the traditional motto saying that the United States is a place where many people have come together. But we are united as one. And just as the United States has that as its motto, the church, even more so, should have that as its motto. That we all come from different backgrounds and experiences. We've got different giftings. We've got different passions. But when we come together, the men become one. Now, I'm not talking about that we have all the same kind of like hive mind, that we all are losing our identity. No, we all are still individuals. But we seek Christ together. Paul often, as I said, used the illustration of the body in Romans chapter 12, verse 5. He says it like this. So in Christ, we, though we're many, form one body. And each member belongs to the others. Jesus is the head of the body, of course, and we're all connected to him. But we're also connected to one another. We belong to one another. And we should be united together. You know what happens whenever a part of your body gets hurt? Everybody's experienced that. When you hurt a leg or a foot or a hand or back or something, the rest of your body has to support it. Make up for it. You begin to limb or you lean a certain way or you take care of that part so that it can heal. When you're hurting, a church group is one of the best things you can do to find strength. One of the best support systems out there. See, there's this idea that says, I don't need to be a part of a church. I've got my Bible. I've got Christian music. I can go out and take a walk in the park, and I can pray and worship God there, and I don't need to, to be in a, a church or an organized setting. Well, all of those things are good. I encourage you to do that. But there is something that you miss by not being connected with other Christians. You need to be in church to find strength. One of the number one ways to do that is through a Sunday school. I mention this each week, and I'm going to keep pushing it. If you're not involved in a Sunday school class, we would encourage you to be here at 9.30, find a class for you. We've got them for all ages. You learn the Word, you pray together, you strengthen one another, you laugh. It's a great time of bonding. I encourage you to be a part of that. I mentioned during the announcement time that we're going to start doing some core groups on Sunday nights. The purpose of this is that so that we can go through Scripture, but also to live life together. You say, well, maybe Sunday morning isn't a good fit because of whatever reason, work or schedules. We'll come back Sunday night. Starting on September the 8th, we're going to be in core groups together. And we're going to be learning to live life together biblically. <coughs> when you're a part of a group at church, you can be challenged. You can be held accountable. You can be lifted up and encouraged when you need it most. And you grow. You grow more by studying the Word together, by living life together, by worshiping together. Earlier I mentioned about animals coming together and how they often come together for protection and to provide for their needs. But the church is different than a pack of animals. We, we come together for more than those things. Our togetherness as believers is more about strength to move forward, to be the people God's called us to be, not just for staying humble and safe, and so the fourth thing that we see this morning is that growth in Christ requires change. I just want to talk for a few minutes about change as we are closing up here. We've all been called to change. We've all been called to live that old, leave that old way of life behind. It says that when you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Now change is something that, I don't care who you are, it's not easy. In fact, if it's old habits that you've been accustomed to for most of your life, that's really difficult to change and surrender. Paul gets really practical. 
at the last part of, the, of Ephesians. He says in verse 22, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You are called to be more and more like God. That means putting off the old self every single day. And most change doesn't occur like that overnight. Most change is a slow, steady process. It's making the right decision each and every time. And we don't always do that. We take two steps forward and three steps back sometimes. But it's that we are striving to be more like Christ. Old habits die hard, but how do you develop new habits? By repeatedly doing that thing over and over again. Do you want to change your thoughts and your feelings? Then change your actions first. That might sound counterintuitive. You say, well, I don't want to do that. I should want to do something before I do it, shouldn't I? Well, if it's pursuing Christ, the Bible says that our flesh doesn't understand that. Our sinful nature doesn't want to be like Christ. Our sinful nature wants to indulge in what this world has to offer. But we are called to something higher than that. And you are to pursue the calling that God has given to you. I love the movie Fireproof. It's about a husband and wife that are, are struggling. They've grown apart. And they're at the verge of getting divorced and breaking up their family. And the husband goes to his dad and he's just kind of venting and he's asking for advice. And the dad tells his son, you need to love your wife. And he says, Dad, I don't think I love her anymore. And he says, treat her like you do. Remember when you first started dating. Remember when you first got married. Remember the kind things you did to her. Remember how you put her needs above your own. Do those things again. But, but Dad, I don't feel like it. I don't care. Do those things and you will start to feel like it. Do the action first and your feelings will follow. Put off the old self. Put on your new self. Jesus said in Revelation, He gave that warning to the church, He said, remember your first love and do the things you did at the beginning. So we need to ask ourselves, is this action, this attitude, this word that I'm saying or this thought that I'm thinking, does it fall in line with my old self that's supposed to be dead? That I'm supposed to be putting off? Or does it fall in line with the new self that I've been called to in Christ Jesus? And we need to look at every aspect of our lives through that lens, and that is not easy. It takes time, and you know what? It takes accountability. It takes people checking in on you. It takes people praying for you. It takes people to build you up when you feel discouraged. And you need that by being part of the church. Paul finishes up Ephesians 4 by talking about specific behaviors that need to change, such as anger, stealing, unwholesome talk, bitterness, rage, and all others. Instead, he encourages believers then to be kind, compassionate, forgiving, and thankful. And remember... Paul's not writing this to an individual. Paul wrote this letter to the entire church in Ephesus. And it was meant to be read together, studied together, and applied together so that together they could grow stronger. And because growth is a slow process, it can be hard to see the benefits of it when you're in the middle of it. In fact, it's often when you are looking back that you say, hey, I've really grown from where I was before. You have to surrender and trust God that He is working in your life. And because we're all at different stages of our journey, we all are at different levels of our faith, and we're all growing at different ways together, the church will never be a perfect place. We'll just admit it right now. This church will never be perfect. There's no church out there that will ever be perfect. We admit that. Because we are all flawed people that all make mistakes, that all still struggle with temptation and sinfulness, but we don't use that as an excuse for not pursuing Jesus. We need to continue to pursue Him. We acknowledge our weaknesses and we look to Jesus for our strength. 
We read the scripture at the beginning of the service, but we'll read it again. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he said to me, who's he? It's Jesus. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Our weaknesses aren't an excuse for sinning. Our weaknesses are a reminder that we need a source of strength greater than ourselves. And that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we are reminded that each and every time we gather together as the church. God calls us to so much more. We are to live lives worthy of our calling. God wants to carry us to the fullness of Christ. And he wants this church to be a healthy body that helps each other become healthier, growing in grace and love. And we're on this journey together. We've been called to this together. And together, with God and each other, we will find God, you are our source. You are our rock and our foundation. You are the one whom we turn when we are, are weak. We are nothing without you. You have designed us and created us and called us and saved us in Jesus Christ. And God, there is power in the blood of Jesus. So Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that has not experienced that power, the forgiving grace of Jesus, Father, if they would experience that today, they would put their trust in you. They would submit to you. They would be buried in baptism, putting that old way of life behind, dying to the old and being raised to the new and walking in the life you've called us to live. And for those of us that are here, Lord, that are not united together for whatever reason, maybe it's still pursuing selfishness or desires. Maybe it's uh, pain, it's hurt. Yeah, we know there's so many reasons. I pray that you would build us up as one body, connected to Jesus as the one head of the church, but also to one another. May we be strengthened because we are encouraging one another to follow you all the way to the fullness of glory in Jesus Christ. So God, transform and renew us. Lead us, convict us, show us. What's the next step? What do we need to trust you in right now? And may we do it in Jesus' name.